Here's what we're doing. Acts chapter 4. Go ahead and break out your Bibles or device. Um, If you have one, if you do not have a Bible, uh, we have a white paperback one somewhere near you, maybe under your seat or in front of you or behind you. Just feel free to grab one of those. If you don't own a Bible, that's our gift to you. But we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 4 specifically today. Um, So here's what we're going to kind of tie this together with. The Acts 242 experience. That's kind of what I'm calling this. The Acts 242 experience is really where all this kicked off about us doing life together. This idea of simple community. Like that's what we've been talking about for weeks now. This idea of simple community. Acts 242 is really the central verse that encapsulates encapsulates us doing life together in simple community. It's a life uh, experienced by the apostles' new life with its fast-growing church. Like it was a fast-growing church where people are devoting themselves to the rich teaching. They're devoting themselves to this, this new Greek word we learned, koinonia, which means community. So it's a satisfying, rich life of where they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Uh, they're, they're devoting themselves to doing life together in community. Uh, they they are, are joyfully worshiping together. And because of that, there's this expansive and explosive growth. And really what that means is, is like this, this, this spirit of the church that was going on. It was like a, it was like a rocket thrust. It was like a rocket thrust that, that, that forced the church into a needy world. And, and, and what I mean by that, uh, it forced them into really doing life together, entering into each other's circumstances. There were needs being met. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. As a matter of fact, you see Acts 2. Acts 2 demanded Acts 3. Like when we read Acts 2, and if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read Acts 2. It demands Acts 3. And, and so, so without entering in, without entering into life together, without this style of generosity and sharing and devotion of the Acts chapter 2 community, there would, be, there would not be the healing experience we find in Acts 3. You tracking with me on that? Like if people weren't entering into one another's lives, the Holy Spirit hadn't poured himself out, and people started doing life together in a community-type fashion where they needed each other, then we wouldn't see the, the Holy Spirit using those people who were doing life together to heal, make healing happen in the name of Jesus. So Acts 2, God's, God's got a plan here. Acts 2 demands Acts 3. So basically, the healing power of Acts 3 led to the early church taking this inevitable step towards growth. They were growing. Um, I'm getting a little bass up here, Dwayne. I don't know if that's uh, am I, am I shake rattling you guys out there? No? All right, good. All right, so maybe it's just my Barry White coming out in me. So channeling my inner Barry White. <laughs> Um, so, so basically, this, this step towards growth is so crucial because where the church was was in this transition of the way it used to be in the Old Testament. And then Jesus came on the scene and changed everything. He came on the scene and changed everything. So having been infused with the power of the Spirit, moving, <clears throat> excuse me, moving out into the world with this regenerative healing power was just basically, it it was the next step. Like to move into people's lives and and there become this healing and this ministering to one another was simply just the next step. And it's that step that led to the early church to face what comes next. And this is what happens when you're on a journey, when you're taking steps in life together, what happens sooner or later? There's an obstacle. Can anybody testify to that? If you're stepping and you're headed towards something, sooner or later it's like, oh, there's a big log in my way. 
I'm going to have to go around that. There's always this point of opposition. As we're on a journey together, doing life, taking steps, at some point in time, there's going to be an obstacle. And this is where we come into Acts 4. The early church, this is their first take, their first time to face opposition. It's their first bout with persecution. So here's the thing. We must understand, and and I, I want you to hear this, persecution is a primary part of genuine Christian faith. You listening? Persecution, suffering, is a primary, uh, it's just a primary thing that we deal with by simply doing life together in the name of Jesus Christ. It's just, it's just what happens. Persecution is, is just... Uh, it's just a, a, a something that's going to happen. So here's what I want you to do. You're in Acts chapter 4. I want you to literally turn backwards in your Bibles about 10 chapters. John chapter 15. If you just move backwards in your Bibles, it's the last gospel. John chapter 15. I want you to, to look at what Jesus says. And I want you to see it with your own eyes. John chapter 15, starting with verse 18. This is what Jesus told his disciples. Everybody good? John chapter 15, starting in verse 18. This is something you need to hear. We all need to hear this. If the world hates you, this is Jesus talking. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world... The world would love you as its own. But, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Why does the world hate you? Because Jesus chose you. That's why the world hates you. Why, does, why, do I, why do I face persecution? Why do I face obstacles in my life? Because Jesus chose you and he did this regenerative work in your heart that made you say, you know what? I can't do this life on my own anymore. I need Jesus. And because of that, people are going to come at you and be like, what? why are you doing? You've changed. What's going on? Like, what's, what's up? Yeah, I've changed. Because I don't, I don't live for me now, I live for Jesus. So it says the world's going to hate you because the world hated him first. And look at verse 20. It says, this is, this is like my favorite word in the Bible, right? What does it say? Remember. And I think it's a, it's a good word to what? Because it's worth remembering. It's a lot of remembers, right? You remember? What's the word? All right, Stephen, you like you just out like you didn't know what I was saying. All right, so we we want to remember. It says, "Remember the word that I said to you: a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you." That's about as real a statement as you can get. No, sir, it, 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 you're not above the master. If he took it, you're going to get it. Right? And, and so basically, in this, he goes on to say, if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So just, to, just as much as true is if those who are persecuting you because they hated me, those who loved me will also love you. And, and I don't know if you have this going on in your life, but every day I have to wake up and I have to pray for you people to where I say, God, help me see them like you do. Boy, that was... Nobody laughed or nothing. That was awkward. Y'all made me feel like really bad. But I, I was y'all, y'all, seriously, do we not need that? Do we not need to pray every day? Don't tell me you don't wake up going to work every morning going, I can't wait to see everybody at work. Oh, now, now, we're, now it's resonated. It was like all personal when it was y'all. But yeah, but I mean, by the way, some people are saying that when they're on the way to work about you, just so, in case you didn't know that. Somebody's praying that when they get to work, they don't punch you in the throat. So just go ahead and wrap your mind around that and realize that, you know what? You need to pray 
If we all did that together, if we all prayed, Jesus, help me see people like you see them. Wouldn't it just be a glorious world? Seriously. Would we not, would we not treat one another better? Would we not have more understanding? Would there not be this, this idea of grace that flows through us? If we prayed, Father, help me see this person who is grating on my nerves. Help me see them like you see them. Because you know how Jesus sees them? He sees them worthy of the cross. And I think that, that should really just make us pause. And, and, and just realize that, you know what, we, we need to, if, if people hate us because, because they hated Jesus, then if they love Jesus, they're going to love us. That should be encouraging. As believers, we need, to, we need to press into that, not back up from that. Maybe, maybe our prayer needs to be, you know what, that's not really my attitude. I'm not loving on my brothers and sisters like I should be. Maybe our prayer should be, Help me in that, Father. Help me to love these people deeper. Um, that's, a, that's a constant prayer of mine. Um, to help me to love you deeper, for you to love me deeper, but more importantly, for me to love Jesus deeper. And then to just see, see you as Jesus sees you. So when Jesus is saying this, that they're going to they're gonna persecute you because they perted persecuted me, he's basically using something called a, a fortiori logic. And basically what that means is, that's, a, that's just a you know, big word meaning that what is true for the greater, in this case Jesus being the greater, is also true for the lesser, the lesser being us. So what's true for the greater, this logic is what's true for the greater will also be true for the lesser. So look at, look at this way, um, look at it this way, as we grow in Christ's likeness, as we take steps to be more like the Lord, the reward is not fame and adulation, but it's persecution. So as we grow closer in Christ's likeness, it's not, oh, look, this, they're more like Jesus. It's like, oh, who do they think they are, Jesus? It, it fleshes out in persecution. That's what he's teaching us here. The more we become like him... The, the, the more we're going to face persecution. Uh, Paul writing to Timothy to strengthen him in, the, in, in persecution, to strengthen him as he was facing persecution from, from the church. Ministry said, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He's basically letting young Timothy know, you're not alone. You're not alone. All, all will face this persecution. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy. He, he, he's a martyr. His name is uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're just kind of getting to, to know who some of these Christian guys from the past are, this is a guy you want to know, especially if you like James Bond movies. Like Dietrich Bonhoeffer was the James Bond of theology, of, of loving God, because he was a, he was a spy during World War II, a German spy, a Christian man, and he entered into this and, and was basically martyred for his faith during that time. So the martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this from a prison cell in 1937. Suffering is a badge of the true Christian. The disciple is not above the master. Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ. And it is therefore not at all suffering that Christians should be called upon. Or, excuse me, it's therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. So according to Bonhoeffer, being a Christian, it simply means this. No compromise. We're called to suffer. We don't compromise. We don't give up. We don't give in. We see what's ahead and we press in. Just as Jesus pressed in. This is what's in front of me. Let's get after it. No compromises. You with me? It means no compromise. So, so if, if the master Jesus suffered, why should we expect anything else? 
We pursue this life of Christ with no compromise. And, and, and really and truthfully, that's not all bad. When you think about it, I, I love the way I was reading study and I, there was this bishop who said this, and, and I thought this was pretty cool because suffering's not all bad because the bishop said it like this. He said, if you're on your back, you're looking at heaven. That's pretty clever, isn't it? I mean, here, here's the thing. When, when we're facing persecution and we are suffering, we get knocked down. We, we end up on our backs a lot, Right? So what a, what, a, what a cup half full way to look at that. Even when you're on your back, you're facing heaven. I think that's a beautiful, a beautiful quote to, to just kind of wrap our minds around, to know that when the Spirit reigns in our life, when the Holy Spirit is reigning in our lives, there will be persecution, yes, but there will also be heavenly focus. Persecution, yes, but when we're on our backs... We're staring into heaven. It's just a great way of looking at, at, at the design of God's plan for our life. So, how did the early church respond to this opposition? Um, so, Acts chapter 4 is what we're going to be looking at. Go ahead and turn there. But let me kind of remind you about what just happened in Acts chapter 3 as you're getting to chapter 4 again. So the lame beggar who had just been healed by Peter and John, he enters Solomon's porch, which we see Acts 3.11. Um, and his joy is echoing throughout the temple. Peter's sermon that followed was equally dramatic, just as dramatic as this lame beggar who was healed, who's who's now uh, uh, just, he's basically doing jumping jacks and wind sprints. Um, the, this large crowd starts to gather because of this healing of this man who they knew who was lame. And now Peter's dramatic sermon about why he healed or why he was healed, this large group gathers around them. And the fact that, uh, I, think it, I think it speaks volumes that when somebody is actually preaching truth to you, and you see that truth standing there when it was once lying, lying on the ground. When you see that truth up and hopping around and doing like, you know, stretches and lunges and getting ready to, you know, do a 40. I mean, that's like, that's real. Like this guy was laid out his whole life, right? And now he's Usain Bolt. Y'all know who that is? He's a runner. Who should I say? Is that all right? Okay. I want to be I want to be relevant to all all ages, but Usain Bolt's fast. Just in case you didn't know, but this guy was he was lame and laid out, and now he is he's up and running around and he's praising the Lord on on Solomon's porch in the temple, and 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 he is just it gives it gives us serious credibility. It gives Peter's sermon serious credibility when it's like, yeah, that guy you know him right. Uh, he once could not walk, and now he is walking. That's automatic cred. Straight up, legit cred right there. You get credibility when it's like, that's all you got to do. You don't have to say, believe me, see for yourself. You knew him, right? He couldn't walk. He hasn't been pretending for 40-something years. He couldn't walk. And now he is. Praise be to God. So let's dig into Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Look at this, verse 2. Here's a big hint. They were greatly annoyed. So as we see that in Scripture, we have to ask, why were they greatly annoyed? Oh, it tells us. Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> so because they're proclaiming this Jesus and his resurrection, verse 3 tells us, they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Verse 4, but many of those who had heard the word, what? Believed It was too late. Truth already got out. The word had been preached. The miracle was running around a portico, jumping up and down, rejoicing. It was out. So many, 
Verse 4, but many of those who had heard the word believed. And look at this. This is what I love about preaching the word of God. When you preach truth and love, this is what happens. And the number of men came to about 5,000. When I'm talking about rapid church growth, this is what I'm talking about. By the way, this is Peter's second sermon. Second sermon. Proofs in the pudding. This is just awesome. 5,000 people. So let's talk about the Sadducees for a moment, just to get, get on the same page, because some people may not know exactly who the Sadducees are. Notice the Sadducees are leading out here, because if, you, if you've read the gospel stories about Jesus' persecution, who were the ones leading out in, in Jesus' persecution? The Pharisees, that's right. It was the Pharisees leading out. So we hear a lot about the Pharisees, which were the, the religious leaders of the day who were leading out in the, in the persecution of Jesus for religious reasons, misguided conviction. But the Sadducees' opposition came largely from political motivation. So they, they kind of teamed up. One was more concerned about the religious aspects of what Jesus was doing, and one was more concerned about the political uh, aspects of what was happening in the name of Jesus. So, 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 so what happens here is this is why the Sadducees were not as involved in early persecution against Christ. But as they started to see the growing threat to their own political structure, structure they became like merciless enemies. They're like, all right, this was a church issue. Now they're kind of messing up my gig. We, we got to do something about this. So, so as a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, and this is, this is something that I think is important for us to know. In the book of Acts, persecution was largely committed and instigated by the Sadducees. Not the Pharisees. The Pharisees were doing most of the leading of the persecution during while Jesus was, was walking the earth. Now here in the book of Acts, when Jesus has ascended to heaven and his, his apostles are leading out in the church, we see the Sadducees are, are now starting to kind of lead this charge. And the Sadducees were this highly sophisticated blue blood group. They were highly sophisticated, uh, and, and basically they were, they were, they were just coming to, to, to take care. These guys were dangerous, not only because they were blue bloods and because they were highly educated, uh, but they were educated, they were wealthy, they were elite, but they were also unprincipled collaborationists. Like, like they were political brown nosers. Uh, they, they would, these people would sell their own children to stay in the power. You, you understand what I'm talking about? Like all they cared about was power, their agenda. They were evil control freaks and they didn't want anyone rocking their boat. And that's where we pick up in verse 5. It said, and on the next day their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. So Caiaphas is a name we, we've heard before in the Gospels, as one who worked in conjunction with the Pharisees, representing the Sadducees and this, this political element. Verse 7, and it says, And when they had set them in their midst... They inquired, and this is an important question for you to see. This is what the Sadducees ask Peter and John when they get them in their courtroom, basically. Courts called to order, and they said, By what power or by what name did you do this? So the courtroom set, the Sadducees, the highly sophisticated blue bloods, right, had come to take care of these hayseed Galileans. That's what, that's what they, were, they were doing. They were like, this is, gonna, this is easy. It's going to be in the bag. These guys are a bunch of stupid fishermen. We got them. 
And, and, and so they, 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 they piled him in here. And, and it's important to know this, that, that Annas, it, it gives him the, he was called the high priest. But at this point in time, it was an honorary title because his son-in-law, Caiaphas, was the actual high priest. Nevertheless, this, this political elite family, so to speak, they call him the high priest. He was like, it, it was literally like the mafia, like he was the Don. He was, he, was the, he was considered the godfather of the, this, this, this Sadducees group of people. He, he basically was the boss of Palestine. So, so even though Caiaphas was the actual high priest, the respect still fell to Annas. So even, even though Caiaphas had the title, Annas, his father-in-law, was still calling the shots. You with me? So they, they gather him up and... and <clears throat> And so, the question that, look at this, the question in verse 7, by what power or by what name did you do this? That question was a trap. That question was nothing but a trap. And, and, and it was a subtle enough way to put it, but it was a deadly trap. It was a deadly trap because if, if the apostles' accusers could get them to admit the healing to any power other than Jehovah, other than Yahweh, if they could get them to admit that this healing occurred in anyone else's name, then, then by, by Scripture, by the law alone, the law of Moses, they could put them to death. It was a trap question. Because they, they knew who they were preaching in the name of. And I mean, this is something that would be like paralyzing fear if you're Peter and John, because I don't, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but just, just like 10 chapters ago, right? These guys were complete cowards when their buddy Jesus got drugged off and they started to beat him and crucify him. They all ran and hid. Peter and John, uh, John hung around, but Peter ran and hid. And Peter's doing all the talking. Peter ran and hid with the rest of the disciples. And, and these guys were complete cowards. So just, just a few, few uh, a month, like a month earlier, a month and a half, two months earlier, Peter had actually denied Christ three times. And now he's being asked the question, whose name are you doing this healing in? This would have been a great opportunity for the fourth denial. Because he was standing in front of a group of men who could have him killed. But not this time. This time, Peter didn't run. This time, Peter didn't back down. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders... If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Verse 10. <clears throat> Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Peter wasn't running anymore. Peter had seen the risen Christ. Peter wasn't afraid anymore. He's like, you know what? I've seen that no matter what, with this power of the Holy Spirit that was promised to me from God, it's within me, it's emboldened me, that now I'm not afraid to die. Because all it's going to do is send me to be with Jesus. He didn't care. He's like, give me what you got. He's like, I'm, I'm telling you, this is because of Jesus. Verse 11, look at this. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. I love that boldness, man. Peter's like bowed up. Jesus was the stuff. He was rejected by you. The builders. Which has become the cornerstone. Verse 12. And there is salvation. Look at this. There is salvation in no one 
else. Look at that. That's a definitive statement to these scary, powerful, elite men. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men which, by which we must be saved. Now, pay special attention to verse 13. Because th- this, is, this is the tipping point. This, this is crucial. Now, when they, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the elders, the, the ruling council of this, this area, they said, they said, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, that these hayseeds had some game. These boys weren't just fishing, throwing nets. They, could, they, they, they had some word on them. They came ready to talk. They're not afraid of us. When they perceived they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized, look at this, and that they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Let me tell you something. The best I got is a Shelby County High School education. And I hope one day people will say about me, you know what, I could tell Joe had been with Jesus. I don't care what your story is, what kind of degree you got, what kind of degree you don't have, what your classification is, what your socioeconomical uh, issue is, where you're at, where you were raised, who you're from. When people see that you've been with Jesus, things change. Their opinion of you will change. Because there is something different about someone who walks with Jesus. There is a higher calling about someone who spends time with Jesus. Verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, look at this. This is my favorite part. Don't you love it when people that think they know it all, you get them? You just, it's like, I'm going to savor this for a moment. <sighs> you know, it's like, it, 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 we shouldn't feel that way. I mean, that's probably, you know, I'm probably, I shouldn't even be gloating over that. But I mean, I just love it when you back, somebody like thinks they know everything and they're like, oh, and then you, you drop knowledge on them and they're like, you know, I, I, I just, I, that's pride. I need to repent. I'll be at the altar later. You could join me. Pray for me. Um, but, but, but seeing this man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Let's be real. What could they say? The dude is healed. He's whole. He's standing right beside him. I mean, if you want to talk about a mic drop moment, Peter's like, uh, yeah, we did this in Jesus' name, and it worked. Come at me, bro. I mean, there is nothing, there is nothing that is just, uh, it's mind-blowing. But look at verse 15. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they started to talk to one another. It said they conferred with one another, saying, Hey, what are, what are we going to do with these guys? What should, we, what, what should we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them, and it's evident. To all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. Even the guys who wanted to be right knew they were wrong, and they're like, we, we got to do something with them, but we don't know what to do because it, it, it's true. This has never happened to us before. Usually we stand up, we, we, we you know, bow up our chest, and we say, look at the many degrees we have on the wall, and, and people bow down. These fishermen aren't like that. They came back at us, and there's, there's evidence of, of, of truth to what they say. What are we going to do? And then look at verse 17. But in order 
but in order that it may spread no further among the people. This was their, their concern to kind of control this so it wouldn't spread to other people. Let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So the threat didn't work last time. We're going to give it another shot. It didn't work, but here's what we're going to do. We're just going to say, okay, we'll let you guys go, but don't talk about this anymore. This right here, circle of trust. We're just going to, we'll let you go. We're not going to kill you. We're not going to nail you to a tree because that's what could have happened. But in order for your release, you just got to be quiet. Let's see how that goes. Verse 18, so they called them in and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Whether it's right or wrong for us to to disobey you or not in this court, our Lord has revealed something to us. Our Lord has changed our life. Our Lord has revealed something to us that can't be silenced. We can't stop talking about it. I don't care what you're threatening. We can't stop Moving, We can't stop stepping towards this truth because it's too good and it's too real. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Look at this. Why, why could they not punish them? Because they had no power. You remember that 5,000 that was standing around? That 5,000 that was standing around now believed Peter and John. They lost their authority to two hayseed fishermen. Now they're like, we're outnumbered. So, so a degree will still get your butt kicked if you're outnumbered. Just say, it. you can try and be right. But if the odds are against you, it's better just to slide on out. Just saying, that's just, I grew up in Wilsonville. I'm just telling you, if there's more of them than you, don't let pride get you hurt. Slide on out. And, and so, so. This, this, is, this man that was healed was standing there and they're like, we can't not speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had no further, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because the people for all, all the people that were there, look at this, for all were praising God for what had happened. The crowd turned. And mind you, this was the same crowd that had been chanting, crucify him. But now because of a healed, lame beggar, they're rejoicing with this man. They're rejoicing. So, and and, and look at this, it says, verse 22, For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. They had history with him. They knew he was lame from birth. It was no doubt. This wasn't a trick. He was healed. They saw it with their own eyes. Guys, this kind of faith, and and you have to realize, the 5,000, seeing was believing. What I'm about to say, don't, don't take me wrong here, but faith sometimes is taking a step without knowing there's anything to step on. Sometimes taking that step out in faith is because you don't see, but you believe. That's the very definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. And so, so when we, we step out in faith... These people had the benefit of seeing. And God used that to show them. Why? So we could read about it. And say, well, if these people wanted him dead, and now their minds have been transformed, and now they want, they, they believe, because they saw something happen, it must be true. Their Lord, listen... 
this is what's happening to the apostles. Their Lord was saturating their emotion, compelling their wills, energizing their bodies so that, that, that no matter the Sadducees, Sanhedrin, they weren't just seeing them. They weren't just seeing fishermen. They were seeing Jesus. They were so filled with the Holy Spirit, they weren't seeing Peter and John. They were seeing Jesus. Not only that, but Peter and John, filled with the Holy Spirit, were in constant communication with their Lord. So as the Jewish leaders were seeing Peter and John, they were seeing Jesus. Because there was communication. There was a oneness. There was community with the Lord. Not just with each other. But they were so filled with the Holy Spirit that they were saturated in this. And the apostles were able to respond to the opposition they were facing because they were walking with Christ. This is the thing. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what obstacles are in your way. But this is what I know. If you're going at it alone, it hurts. It's tough. But when you go into that opposition, when you go into that obstacle with Jesus, the creator of the world is with you. The creator of your very life is with you. Protecting you, walking with you, even carrying you in the hardest times. Just a thought. What if we took a step today instead of in the name of our heroic efforts? What if we took a step towards whatever battle we're facing in the name of Jesus? What would that look like? Because I know I know the struggle. I'm there. I want to, I want to, I'm a dude. I want to take care of it myself. I think we all have that in us. But what if we were to, to walk towards this obstacle, this opposition, this persecution in the name of Jesus? Because when it comes to following Christ, look right at me. When it comes to following Christ, there is no compromise. When it comes to following Christ, there is no compromise. What does that mean for us? It means that when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, Christ is the focus of our lives. No compromise. It means the Holy Spirit does not promote Himself. He promotes Christ. It means that we can't rest on the fact that we prayed for the Spirit's fullness five years ago. We can't... Live in the past. We can't worry about what, what we did when we were seven years old. We walked an aisle. We have to be in the Spirit today. We have to engage the Spirit in constant prayer for His fullness. Not something that you did when you were a kid. Not, not something that you did five weeks ago. Something that's today. You need Jesus now. Every morning you have to wake up and die to self and be risen in the newness of life that Christ gives you. Because if you're not, if you're living in the past, you're not walking in the fullness of Christ. You're living in the glory days. Today is glory revealed in Christ. In Christ. It means we must spend time. This is, I can't say this enough. When I say no compromise, I mean no compromise. It means we must spend time in God's Word. Are you hearing me? No compromise. We must spend time in God's Word. The Bible is like a mirror. It's reflecting the light of God onto us. We must stay in God's Word, no compromise. We must remain in the Word, no compromise. Constantly learning, constantly being taught, not relying on what we've learned in the past, but interacting with experiencing Christ fresh and anew today, relevant in our lives now. Not the past, 
today. It means that we spend time with God's people. No compromise. The scripture says that we should not forsake meeting together. Because we need each other. We need each other desperately because we don't want to walk this life alone. And God says you don't have to. That's the very thing of of simple community. That, That we would become like the people in Acts 2. That we would start to, to spend time in the light of, of Christ flows out of his people. I mean, we, do you realize that we kind of become like the people we're around? Have you noticed that? We kind of become like the people we're around. And we're around people who are following Christ. It just, we start to catch fire. It's momentum. Their light is contagious that Christ just flows out of his people and into those around them as we enter in and devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowshipping, the breaking bread together, eating meals together, and praying for one another. Guys, I need you to pray for me. If you're not praying for anybody this week, pray for me. I need it. Man, the devil doesn't give you any days off. I don't know if you figured that out yet or not. But I, I, if you're not praying for anybody, pray for me. And, and if you need prayer, I'd be glad to pray for you. I hope he put you on my mind and heart this week where I just pray for you because I think of you, because I've seen your face this week. That means something. That, because I need you. I need you in my life praying for me, and I need you in my life so I can pray for you. So it's not just about me. Because if left to myself, that's what it would be. I would make it all about me. But I need to do life with you. Desperately. When it comes to doing life together, we can't compromise. No compromises. We do it just the way Jesus said to do it. We must be a part of simple, gospel-centered community. Are you listening to me? Do you hear me, people? We must be a part of simple, gospel-centered community. It's not an if. It's a must. It means we must spend time in prayer to the Lord. No compromises. We spend time with God, just talking to Him. Because as we fellowship with the Lord, the perfume of His life makes us, as the Scriptures say, the very fragrance of God. We must pray. There's no compromise in that. So I'll tell you what, if you would, bow your heads with me. And let's pray now.